yeah, so so what? I am here. Uh, yeah. Hey, everybody. So hold your applause, please. Um, but yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. So let, let me do this. So, uh, you know, I'm going to chop this up into a few different segments. Yeah. So um, uh, before we get into uh, Secret Invasion uh, Redux, um, tell me about your experience with the Beyond. Uh, oh, okay. And, but, but do me a favor, since we are recording this, can you just talk briefly, everyone here might already know, I don't know, talk briefly about the movie, like what it's about and Fulci. I'm, I think everybody knows who Fulci is. I, I don't think anybody really knows what the beyond is about. So I'll try, I'll try to the best of my ability um, okay. to, you know, to, um, so I had recently, I don't know if these guys know this either. I had recently seen the beyond. Uh, it was a one night only screening that was at a local uh, art house cinema that was in Pittsburgh. It's called the row house cinema. And they will often program, you know, certain, just different, different kinds of events. And, uh, this was, I believe, the 4K version that Grindhouse Releasing mm -hmm. put out, and I'm pretty sure it was the composer's cut. Uh, basically, The Beyond, it's a, it's a Lucio Fulci movie uh, from 1980 that is basically about a young woman that inherits a, a hotel that is one of the gateways into, into hell, one of the seventh gateways. Yes, there it is. I'm screen sharing. Yes, and they have the Book of Avon, and lots of weird, trippy things happen, as per uh, Lucio Fulci, and, uh, you know, hilarity ensues, <laughs> as they say. Um, and actually, with my audience, I think that they did think hilarity ensued. It was a lot of younger people that were kind of laughing at certain parts of the movie that I wouldn't necessarily think are, like, super funny, but... <laughs> That seems to be a problem with a lot of these uh, revisiting. Uh, well, these see, older see a, lot of, a lot of what happens is that, uh, you know, most of these younger folks, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty young myself, but most of them kind of view this stuff ironically. You know, irony is like yeah. the big thing for the hip film bros now. And so they kind of look at it as being, you know, cheesy special effects and all this kind of stuff. I mean, I find all of it to be to be riveting but like the scene with the tarantulas there's a for those who don't know there's a tar there's tarantulas that come out of the ground and they eat the guy's face spoiler alert and uh when that happens like the whole the whole audience you would have thought it was like monty python i mean they just thought that that was absolutely hilarious um some of the idiosyncratic like scenes where some of the dialogues a bit weird or the performances are a bit weird i mean some people laughed at that and that's fine i laughed at that too but yeah, some of the gore parts, I was kind of surprised that people found it as, as raucous as they did. But, um, and, uh, <laughs> and I'm pretty sure yeah, that picture of me is not funny. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if that's your sense of humor, that's your sense of humor. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's just you, dude. No, I'm kidding. Well, was, I'll, I'll gonna explain why I chose that picture in a minute, but go ahead, Tim. Was there anything as far as what the movie's about that you wanted me to go into, or was that a pretty succinct, um, yeah, I, I, I yeah, it was kind of an overview of the movie as a movie, you know, as an existing work of art. Uh, just real quick, as far as the, the plot, it, there is a plot, yeah. and, you know, it, it, but it has a dreamlike yes, yeah. aura to it through quite a lot of the movie to where it just finally goes off the rails, but I think it elegantly goes off the rails, and... Yeah. I, in that sense, it felt just like a nightmare or a dream to me. Yes. Yeah. And the first time I finally saw the movie, which was about 1998, I borrowed it from this cat, the Marchman, who had like thousands of movies he duped. And he's the, good, he's the first guy who showed me Cannibal Holocaust. Anything I hadn't seen up to 1998, I'm like, can I, yeah, I said, yeah, I got it. Here you go, take it home. Um, and when it got to the end, I was, I was kind of stunned. Um, I was really like, I wasn't expecting Fulci to have that kind of poetic side to him. Yeah. Um, and the ending was so good that one of the more hyped horror movies uh, from a couple of years ago, The Void, stole the ending, you know, probably <laughs> made him. Yeah. Um, now, I liked The Void. The first time I saw it, it was too derivative for me. But after two years, I watched it again and I thought, like, okay, I think it stands on its own. Yeah. But yes, it lifted the ending of the beyond. So, However, so just, ju just a comment with that, because something that I noticed with this too, and I was always kind of perplexed by this, is that a lot of the kind of like art house horror that they put out now, not all A24, but they've been guilty of doing this, seem to kind of do that Quentin Tarantino effect where like 
Tarantino kind of made cult movies cool and mainstream and a lot of the mainstream critics liked his stuff because they were like oh it's literate and he knows what he's doing and all this kind of thing and a lot of those A24 movies and and some of those like lower budget that are trying to like cash in on like 80s nostalgia because you're talking about the void doing that to me kind of try to do that you know they'll be like oh, you know, th there's never been a movie like this that's had dream logic and going into weird portals. And I'm like, no, there's been several, you know, <laughs> the, the, void, like the, the Void is to me a very- I think tough. Black Magic Rights is one of the best of those. Oh, it I don't really think is like that. a dream. Yeah, no, that's a non sequitur, but he's right. He mentioned that in the last one too. We'll, we'll talk about that sometime. Uh, okay. Paul Selle is the director. He directed a few with uh, Mariska Hargitay's father, Mickey Hargitay. Oh, okay. And this dead actress who's now dead named Rita Calderoni. The, the four, three of them did like three movies together, and they're all just completely insane. Completely insane. They're not trying to be good. They're not really <laughs> trying to be bad. They're just like, whatever, you know, uh, let's get as much sex, violence, and yes, dream logic or illogic we can. And it works, you know. Um, but uh, as far as, yeah, to, real quick, The Void is like, a very deliberate mashing of Clive Barker, John Carpenter, and Lucio Fulci. I mean, it's 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 not just in the DNA. It's like it's like rising to the surface of the yeah, street. You can you yeah. can see them. And and what's funny is I think that people don't really realize that those three filmmakers are very thematically linked together. I personally well, they are, and and they're very to me. Those guys are all very much have been much more successful at being Lovecraftian than Stephen King or all the Lovecraftian yeah. writers. Yeah, In yeah. the sense of that, because, yeah. you know, look look at, uh, so Fulci has tr a trilogy of films that are basically, I call, them, I call them the Lovecraftian trilogy. I've only heard them call that once in print ages ago. Most people call them all kinds of other different things. But mm -hmm. um, though some people do call it a cosmic horror trilogy and things that are Lovecraftian. Uh, I think they're very Lovecraftian and in a great way. And yeah, they're more gory, they're modern, but that's cool. So what? Um, but he was doing that, you know, decades before this wave that's been going on the last 10 years of modern gory H.P. Lovecraft novel. And yeah. a movie that I believe it, uh, Fulci strongly influenced, I bet he would never admit it, but was also Lovecraftian, is John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness. Yes. There's yes. quite a lot in Prince of Darkness that Fulci did several years earlier. Yeah. And, and I love Prince of Darkness. Prince of Darkness is, is probably like, it, it's basically the beyond. There's a lot of stuff in that that I think is like the beyond. It's deep. Um, it's a deep yeah. movie. And, and yeah. you know, Carpenter was bouncing back from uh, being, you know, he was right there where he was huge with Starman. Yeah. And, you know, if he'd have kept going off that ledge, he probably wouldn't have done any more good movies. But instead, he regrouped and like wrote these two movies back to back under a pseudonym. And to me, they're most, his most brilliant writing, that one, and they live, to me, that's what, and they had had much lower budgets than his other yeah. movies. He I, put I a lot think, of money himself. I think most of John Carpenter's stuff is Lovecraftian. I mean, even if you look at something like Halloween, which is, of course, one of his most mainstream things, the, the way that he specifically, to me, creates that movie, and especially Actually, like Michael Myers and the shape and stuff is kind of like the unnameable unknowable horror type of thing you know it's like human but not quite human and kind of like weird I mean it's a little bit it's not cosmic in the terms of what Lovecraft did with that but there's definitely he has themes of being alienated from people like yeah. from society that I think that's what Lovecraft is to me that's his that's his foundational um subtext is that, the outsider yeah, yeah, and and Carpenter's work, as far as it's like the way that he feels about small town America and that kind of—I mean, that's and that's definitely in Halloween. That's in stuff like Assault on Precinct Thirteen, you know, a bunch of those kind of. So there's even Lovecraft because I think a lot of people who haven't really read him, they think Lovecraft is just strictly cosmic, and you know, and we all know there's so many other great stories that he did that aren't directly cosmic. I mean, they have supernatural or kind of weird there, stuff, but there were, there really yeah. aren't that many uh, stories with. Uh, Cthulhu. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the people think are like all oh, their stories are Cthulhu and tentacles. And oh yeah, yeah, I mean they're all they're all connected to that, you know, yeah. loosely. But but yeah, so you, but yeah, you you have you have good points with that. Absolutely. I want to ask uh, Scott something in a second. I'll just real quick explain this picture to you guys and why I chose it. 
because <laughs> when I was looking for widescreen pictures I could do this with, mm -hmm. that one came up, but it had a thing over it that you you know that Facebook does, and there was a ton of matches. I like that. And some were her and then some were other gory pictures from the beyond. And I was like, now Google's doing this themselves. And so I uncovered it and I was like, you know what? Okay, I'm going to, I just want this in my video for a few minutes. You know what I'm and saying? Yeah. <laughs> this, picture just, you, this, Google. this picture just spoiled the ending of Secret Invasion. Way to go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to switch this now that I've explained that. Um, now, getting getting you guys to drop down where I can see you. There we go. Okay. I haven't mastered this completely. Um, that computer, I think. So real quick, the Beyond, uh, and then I want you to go into the uh, score thing, the, the soundtrack thing about yep. it. So yep. uh, it's basically, you know, this woman, Liza, inherits a hotel. So you've got Crutchiona McCall, who is in several of his movies. I think she's in all three of his Lovecraftian trilogies. Um, and... Uh, uh, which yeah, ones are you uh, considering that trilogy? Uh, City of the Living Dead, House by the Cemetery, The Beyond, the ones Bulchy did. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, but but I do consider them. Yeah, I call them. Lovecraft. I don't think he called them that, but he did has gone on record saying he loved Lovecraft. Um, but you know, City of the Living Dead takes place in Dunwich. That's a key key element to it. Um, and the Book of Avon is in The Beyond. That's a key element. So mm. he's directly in that universe, you know, playing around. Um, but yeah, basically decades ago, this warlock with the Book of Avon was finding all these secrets and these ignorant townspeople in, in Louisiana. And I, I once did a, almost finished a fictional article on fictional New Orleans characters and events. And I made a timeline. I put Beyond in it, intertwined it with some other things. And I made a map and actually located where on the Missouri River that house would be if it were in reality. And they like paddle up the river in the beginning and they go and crucify the warlock, throw lie on him, which, you know, melts his face. And anyway, so his name's Spike and his assistant, you could call, you may say maybe his Clea, his Doctor Strange uh, disciple, Emily, uh, looks in the book concurrently and the, what she sees blinds her. And so 50 years later, 53 years later, she comes to Liza when she buys this house, and it's the same house. And so, of course, there's all kinds of haunting and weird shit and zombies popping up underground. And a lot, uh, Emily is like her guide. You know, she's like this prophet, uh, prophetess. Um, I, I, did we lose Justin? Well, hopefully he'll come back. <laughs> but, uh, you're the overlook. You can't leave when you're in the overlook. No, you can't. Uh, <laughs> Justin, uh, oh, I was going to say something about Justin. Not Justin. Emily, uh, yeah, her eyes are are um, blind and they're white, but we later learned that that's kind of a consequence, not so much only literally of her and the book burning, but of seeing into the beyond, that other dimension. And Spike, when he was killed, was painting that other dimension, what's on the other side. And she hooks up with a doctor, Dr. John McCabe, who's named after a character from one of Fulci's favorite directors, Robert Altman. The character's named John McCabe from McCabe and Ms. Miller, mm. and probably a descendant. And um, they go in, you know, he's completely disbelieving, but it's David Warbeck. He's super charming British guy. He's lovable as hell. And they just basically go from the hospital to the house and sometimes inadvertently back and forth, not meaning to, like a dream. And so they are finally, you know, heading to the beyond and itself. And I, I, yeah, I think it's really a masterpiece. I saw it last, I saw it in 2017. So when I saw it, it was, it was the Grindhouse 4K print, but it was uh, Fabio Fritzi and a seven piece frog rock band accompanying him playing the score live. So they mixed out the music and he played the whole score. And he, they more or less played it note for note, but a few little things, some of the instruments improvised, yes. just kind of keep you on your toes. And it was cool. It gave a kind of uh, immediacy to the movie, you know, more bring it to life. So anyway, Tim went to see this event, and your report was? Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it was the composer's cut, because I'm going to be honest with you, I've seen it a few times, but outside of the theme, 
like I would have to watch the Blu-ray because the music did not sound like the music from the original one. But for all I know, I, I think it was the composer's cut, but they didn't advertise it as such. Mm-hmm. So I honestly don't know. I mean, I remember the music was playing outside of that main theme. And I was like, this sounds kind of modern. It almost sounded like somebody came in and was like, oh, this this music sounds too Italian. We need to put something else in here. Mm. Chris, he wrote it. And then, uh, yeah, Chris yeah. Link has sent you. Apparently he started that tour late 2022. So he's still yeah. running. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. he's not appearing every bit. No, I think he no. appeared at the first gig, but. Yes. Now, for the sake of the conversation that we're having right now, and for people who don't know, um, in a similar thing, I got to see a Goblin play Suspiria live last fall, which is pretty mm-hmm. cool. And I actually got to meet Claudio Simonetti, and uh, he is coming back to do Demons, which is going to be freaking awesome because I love that movie. So I'll get to do that again. But I, Fabio Fritzi never never came around uh, Pittsburgh when he was doing that tour of like his his music and things. He never. I was came surprised to- he came to Charlotte. It was one of only maybe 10 or 12 cities in America he did on that tour, yeah, yeah. which yeah. is weird, but I know how he got, he got booked because it's booked at this place called the Blumenthal, which is this, you know, this big skyscraper they built about 15, 20 years ago for all the ritzy people to go and see operas and, you know, all kinds of like elitist stuff. But I mean, I guess you get enough money and enough press, anybody can book it. So they booked it. And so, you know, I'll go up this big elevator and he's on the top floor and there's this theater and I'm like, there's Fabio Fritzi and another playing to be on. And that in and of itself was as surreal as the film. And I took pictures mm. of the people in the audience. I took pictures of them playing and I took one picture of the beginning of the movie because I didn't want to get in any trouble or whatever or I inadvertently hit a flash while the movie's going. But um, that was a great experience. And uh, I saw Suspiria, the remastered, that same year, but it, it wasn't with the original, you know, musicians there, but it was that remastered Synapse cut that's been going around now that Vincent per- Perriera helped Don May do. And that's all Vincent Perriera posted for like three years. Was, I did a great job on Suspiria. <laughs> yeah. Well, well Claudio, Claudio came to Pittsburgh specifically because of the Dawn of the Dead connection. Yeah. And, and he actually um, met with some of the people that run the Living Dead Museum, and they have a wall where all the celebrities from the different Romero movies put their bloody handprints and they signed it. And so he got to come and do that with Goblin. So he was all hyped up. He's like, I'm in the city of the zombies. I love doing this. So that was how I got only loosely connected to what we were talking about, but that's just kind of my, but um, but yeah, yeah, the, the new score, which I guess that's what it was, definitely sounded more hollywood-esque to me at least to me and and so when the theme you know that plays a couple of different times came on it it almost was kind of jarring because the rest of the music that he did didn't really sound like that um i love that i love that italian music that they play in those oh that's one of the greatest soundtracks i I think all i'm a big fan of that italian music Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have I have Italian music for films I haven't seen. So. Well, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I score pieces that I of movies I haven't heard. If I find a composer I like from that era on my TikToks, like a lot of few of my TikTok ads, some of for deep images, I'll be like, yeah, I need to put an Italian soundtrack music. And I'll be like, do they have Stelvio Cipriani? Well, they don't have the one I wanted, but <laughs> this one sounds so lyrical. Well, I'm gonna use it. Yeah, it's, it's just perfect. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. But yeah, it was it was ultimately it was it was a lot of fun. I was I was glad that I got to see that. Um, I was grateful just for for any of those kinds of opportunities to you know to be able to do that. And uh, you know, and it was fun. It added to my horror and cult street cred a little bit that I got to see that. Yeah, so, it, does, it really. Yeah, that's really. And and Henry was kind it. of living vicariously through me because I told him he's like, dude, that that's awesome. And we were you know, 2017. I was able to do all this because I was I, I had a lot of money. Now I got to <laughs> <head> through Tim. <laughs> um, so we're gonna wind down the uh, the beyond uh, just just so we can make sure we get uh, the crux of what we we're talking okay. about. Uh, I wanted to say the the I, I'm not gonna go into detail because I don't want to bring down the energy of the channel to a negative level. Uh, but I'll tell y'all outside of the channel, outside of the video, what details. But my uh, experience with Heather's went horribly awry. Oh, no. Not okay. because of me and not, it, it, 
basically the projectionist at the AMC Carolina Pavilion 22 uh, multiplex, um, who also happened to be the assistant manager, is probably, he might possess an IQ of possibly three. He's, <laughs> yeah. he's, he's extremely, he doesn't know what he's doing, and what he did by fucking up so much it was kind of like pulling the curtain back and seeing Oz because now I know what program they're using to do some of the digital feeds for Fathom. And yeah. I'm a bit disillusioned. Well, I want to tell you really the, cheaper than you I want to tell you is. real quick that Mick Garris about a year ago went mm -hmm. all over Twitter whenever they did, when Fathom events did the screening of the thing, because there were all of these feed problems that was with it. He was in, and so what you experienced is literally what has what happened to it's him. It's the system, and I forgot the name of the system. You might even recognize, you know, the company. Well, it's, direct, it's direct TV that they get mm. the DC through. They, they literally- well, yeah, but it's a, There's another company yeah. that's the actual like digital encoder. Yes. They have, in other words, his laptop popped up on the screen. Yes, yeah. And when I saw Godzilla Tokyo SOS, they did that as a 20th anniversary um, Fathom events. I was very concerned. I was like, oh my God, is that going to happen? It did. It used to be great. Yeah, yeah. It didn't. The picture was a little bit fuzzy, but I could like live with it. But every time I go to a Fathom screening now, I kind of have one bated breath, hoping that nothing goes wrong. It, you know, it's, it's so. Sorry to he sorry to hear that, but that oh, that's okay. Uh, more, but the, the, yeah. There's two other glaring problems that had besides was when he finally settled on playing it from the beginning, kind of because he kept sputtering through the New World logo and the begin. I'm like, what are you doing? Will you stop? Like, because you could see him rewinding and fast forwarding. I'm like, this is the most unprofessional thing I've ever seen in theater. Sorry, mm -hmm. I can I'm do this my lighting. <laughs> and I said, I said it out loud. I said, I can do this at home with my fucking Blu-ray player. I don't need this, you know. Why didn't so we I, do I asked for a discount. I mean, a refund, and I got one. You, you mm. should, you should have had. We could have did a reading on Zoom of the movie. You could have had all of us come on, and we could have just did that and projected <laughs> it on the screen in there. I think that would have been fine. Um, well, what's funny is it's it wasn't framed correctly either, and that's oh, the yeah. first time yeah. it was square. Yeah. I have it on Blu-ray. Yeah. I've had it on DVD. It's a widescreen. It's not a 235 one. Yeah. It's a 185 yeah. one. This was not widescreen. It was like a block. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, it's a good thing they that, that Michael Lehman put the characters really close in the middle of the frame, but it was squeezed well. You know, it didn't look stretched. I mean, but Tim Lucas would have had a heart attack. You know, and David Lynch would have declared war. As, yeah, yeah, yeah. As, long as, as long as it was squeezed well, I guess that's all that really matters at the end of the day. Because that's how I like my lead personally, but, you know, I don't know about you guys. Well, I met the guy because he's the guy who gave me my, my refund. And, and he acted like nothing ever happened. But he, at the same time, <laughs> he, it was obvious he was prepared for this. Yeah. <laughs> the guy called him and then he came out. And he said, okay, so yeah, I can give you a refund. That's the first thing he said to me. Not I'm sorry or what's the problem? Like to care, he just he just picked up right where the other guy, and he's like, yeah, okay, he can give you a gift card. So I, I bought a pizza there. So I have like seven dollars. Whenever there's something there, I'll, I'll yeah. use it. Now, can I ask you this, Henry? Is that yes. old boy screening Fathom events? No, no. Oh, okay. The old boy is the independent picture house, which is literally oh. what it says it is. Oh, okay. And, and I've known the I've known the owner for at least 30, 25 years. Okay. He okay. Used to manage the old repertory theater here, the Manor, which was a quasi repertory because it, it was bought by Eastern Federal. So they would do the trendy art house movies and then they would rotate them with like you know, Apollo 13 or, or something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, he tried, but, you know, <laughs> he used to come in borders when I worked there and I knew he <laughs> wanted to do more and I'm surprised. I saw him Actually, he helped put together that Suspiria screening. That oh. Suspiria screening was at a, a, a theater called Arnsley Grand, which is another huge multiplex. It was way far from everybody I know. And Marksman drove us there, but it's it's like not a theater I'd ever go to. But the, the theater in the plaza where I work does get most of the limited stuff over AMC. It's just this one happened to be AMC. AMC gets more of the Fathom events. Regal gets more of the real art house. Like they got Mandy, they got the house that Jack built. I mean, you know, I, I can rely on them 
if there's a one night a week you know one night in the whole you know uh just like a one night showing nationwide of something strange that's being released they'll probably get it in one screen one theater one thing i will say is cool about amc where about amc is they they play a lot of indian movies and not mm. not not necessarily big ones well not big ones to us and i think there must be an indian community yeah, uh, yeah. near me i know there is where i work but i well, haven't seen it in my area. Anyway, that that might be amc in general because my amc does that all the time they? okay constantly playing hindi movies and bollywood movies i mean that takes up a, a good they don't hype those you have to kind of wander around the theater yeah. and find them yeah yeah, yeah. i know them. in new jersey there are a number of theaters that show a lot of indian films but in the city i'm not aware of it yeah mm. there may be like some in like some of the really high high density indian neighborhoods but i don't really see i mean i i've, I've never seen an indian film in the theater i've, I've seen them on dvd and stuff but and and i and i was surprised because I, I was like on some trip where we we're going through new jersey and i saw some indian films on a marquee so that's the only reason Honestly, I, know I don't even know where to start with indian films half the time i'm interested in them but it's well, such in a modern indian films it's it's a bottomless well yeah yeah and, and now, if I, you want to talk about classic everyone should start with such as it ray okay and, and and i've seen three of his movies which is embarrassing considering people i know like tim mclean and bill have seen all of them and he's like the <laughs> yeah it's he's embarrassing i've seen only one, one. <laughs> okay yeah i i i think uh when i finally saw the first and the trilogy i was like man okay i get it but before that i got uh the criterion of the hero and I wasn't even familiar with that one, but it was sold back. It was super cheap at my work. It's incredible. And man, I mean, his stuff, I mean, it looks incredible. I mean, we're talking about 50s, 60s movies and uh, black and white. I love that look. It looks just as good as the Japanese movies from that period. And like a lot of Indian people in real life, I had no idea of this. The characters speak back and forth between English and Hindi, sometimes in the same sentence. Yes, yes. Yeah, they do that in a lot of those films. But those some co-workers the, the Ray films in are in general. Bengali, I believe, aren't they? What are they? I think I think the Ray films are in Bengali. Yeah, you might be right. Okay, yeah. that that language in English. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of speaking of Hindi and celebrating cultures, Ms. Marvel. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, well, okay, that's a good segue. Uh, <laughs> So, so, uh, so, so, me and Keith uh, talked about Secret Invasion. So, you've seen the whole series. So, yes. he raised I'll tell there. you a great classic of Bollywood is Anand. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a yeah. good one. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> Unam, that one that was uh, shown in Ghost World. I finally saw that one all the way through. I love the music to that one. That's really incredible. But I do like what I've see, seen of it in Ghost World, but I haven't seen the whole film. Yeah, it's, it, I saw it on YouTube one day, finally. I was like, yeah, it's long, though. Kind of long-ish. They, they, most of them are long. There are very few that are not long. But see, I would, I'm just that kind of person. I'd be more interested in starting with that era of Ray and working my way forward. Because the one reason I love foreign movies is not only am I going to another country, I'm going, I'm time traveling, you know? So it's just incredibly, this is what Paris was like in 1968 when the student you know, the students rebelled against the government, you know, and John Luke Godard was there, you know, and it's like so exciting to me. I don't know. It's like a dream. It's not how, how I, one way of time travel. I'm in the Japanese, say no more, you know. 